All right, hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you back to the afternoon session for the housing um, conference we're having today called Acts of Design, New Housing Paradigms in North America. We've spent the morning, for those of you who are uh, just joining the conference, we spent the morning um, looking at work of some architects from Mexico, Mexico City, who are here today. Um, some of those architects will join us again at the end of this um, afternoon session for a roundtable um, discussion, uh, concluding uh, everything. So um, this afternoon, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome for our, our keynote, uh, Maurice Cox. Um, it's his first time speaking here uh, at Columbia, so I'm, I'm thrilled to have him here. Um, Maurice Cox is the Director of Planning for the City of Detroit. He is an urban designer, architectural educator, and former mayor of the city of Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. He most recently served as Associate Dean for Community Engagement at the Tulane University School of Architecture and Director of the Tulane City Center, a university-affiliated practice operating at the intersection of design, urban research, and civic engagement throughout the New Orleans community. Uh, Maurice's work with the Taubman School uh, at the University of Michigan is direct, directly engaging architecture and planning students with the revitalization of Detroit, and he's going to present some of that work this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us, Maurice. Good afternoon. After lunch, guess I'm the dessert. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you, Hillary, for uh, the invitation. I um, shared that it's unusual for, for me to have a chance uh, to talk about a single topic on the recovery of Detroit. So I jumped at the chance to try to frame a little bit what's happening in housing. Uh, and it makes for an it will be an interesting panel at the end of the day in, um, in contrast to some of the challenges that we saw from um, um, Mexico. So um, we're talking, uh, I, I talk a lot about uh, the search that Detroit is on to define what an inclusive recovery um, looks like, uh, what a, a comeback story um, that um, does what other revitalization stories have yet to be able to do, and to do that um, inclusively. And so I'm going to show a, a lot of images, I, but I don't want uh, to give any impression that these are easy answers. Um, this is incredibly uh, complicated to achieve um, this outcome. So um, we're talking about how do you go beyond uh, inclusion uh, and uh, make a commitment that in the space of this recovery, uh, that it is primarily for those who stayed uh, in the city. And so we start from a premise of wanting to retain people uh, at the same time grow the city. Um, so what does it mean? Uh, what does that kind of recovery look like? And what are the, the collateral um, challenges um, to make good on that promise? Um, well, just in 2012, uh, the prognosis of the city was pretty dire. Uh, and the national um, narrative about Detroit being uh, a great American city that was dying before our very eyes um, has a whole host of other things that go, went with it um, that dictates how we approach the recovery. Um, the fear of displacement, um, the racial tensions uh, that uh, ensue uh, when people are jockeying for uh, limited resources and space, um, still um, blight and abandonment, uh, and uh, for many, many years, an absence of government. Government simply um, was not a player. Um, and uh, the largest bankruptcy in American uh, history of, a, of an American city uh, just five years ago. So um, that's um, the background for um, this notion of creating one city uh, for all of us. And, uh, it is both a political campaign, uh, but also a promise uh, that we have made uh, that how we're going to approach um, the recovery is uh, going to not create uh, different types of neighborhoods for different types of people, but to create one city uh, for all of us, which is effectively a, a challenge to integrate the city. Uh, and we don't think that it's effectively been done yet. 
So um, for us, it, it starts with um, giving people a voice in the planning decisions that will affect their life. Uh, so those um, almost 700,000 people who remain are critical to our ability to um, reimagine the city in an inclusive way. So if you start from a, a concept of zero displacement, that means you have to understand collectively what those who stayed uh, desire. Um, so we hold, um, I won't say dozens, hundreds of meetings um, to come up with a framework. Um, and uh, to do that, um, you have to have a, a staff or a group of professionals who are committed um, to that cause. So um, the planning department is about 40 people now. It was six um, three years ago. Um, uh, the majority are people of color. The majority are women, and they're in leadership positions. Uh, the majority live in the city of Detroit, uh, and over 12 uh, languages are spoken. And it's really key um, to being able to build an atmosphere of trust. And um, to put it a little bit in historic, historical context, this image um, from the 1950s of an uh, African-American middle-class family um, um, walking on a uh, really a tree-lined residential street um, was synonymous of what Detroit became for the African-American experience. It, experience. It was over 200,000 people came uh, in the Great Migration uh, North um, seeking uh, those quality um, jobs. And um, it, it, it came to a point in Detroit's um, history during uh, World War II where 700,000 people were employed in the arsenal um, of democracy, building um, ships and planes. Uh, and it grew um, at an extraordinary rate. Uh, over 200 homes were built in just a 20-year um, period. Um, and a lot of times, some of the amenities and services uh, did not accompany them. Um, but what's interesting about that is this is the same period in which the uh, FHA um, was redlining um, most communities, uh, all communities of color, and so much so that um, <clears throat> You can see uh, through the black dots where uh, African Americans lived in Detroit. Uh, and uh, if, if uh, you were in that red area, um, you basically were uh, federally in, um, sponsored segregation by race and class. You could not get a loan um, to fix up your house or own your house. Uh, and so, um, you saw an, uh, a heavy level of light and uh, an expectation that those communities uh, could be removed. Um, a, a, a historic um, occurrence of a developer who attempted to do a new residential subdivision, and it was adjacent to a, um, a African-American neighborhood, and he could not finance the project uh, unless he built a wall to physically separate uh, those two communities. Um, and that wall uh, exists today. Uh, both sides of the wall now are African American. Um, <laughs> and um, it speaks to the reality of Detroit um, today. I mean, Detroit is the blackest city in America. It's 80% African American, 10% Latino, uh, and 10% white. And these are the folks who stayed. And they are uh, largely uh, middle class, working class um, families. Uh, and now they live in uh, all parts of the city. So the neighborhoods you see here are, of which there are dozens and dozens in Detroit, are majority African American neighborhoods. Uh, these are not the neighborhoods uh, that you see on the internet. Um, but it is um, the kind of cornerstone, the anchor of uh, this black middle class that was built. Um, but there is also an extraordinary amount of blight, right? There are still uh, 26,000 single family homes uh, that are blighted. 
there's a, uh, an estimate that maybe 5,000 of them can be saved and sold. There are about 80,000 vacant parcels, uh, and this is all owned um, under a land bank. So um, that's an important point because um, there's been a direct correlation between uh, demolishing blighted housing in neighbor strong neighborhoods and the increase in property values. And to this day, there are about 16,000 houses um, have been demolished in a four-year period. The average is about 100 houses a week are being demolished. Um, and it's largely because the city is so damn big uh, that um, it's going to take a very, very long time to uh, imagine um, a, a, a residential form that can meet that um, level of open space. So the cities, San Francisco, Boston, Island of Manhattan can fit within um, the city limits of a population a little under 680,000. It was once a city of one, uh, 1. 1.8 million. And so um, trying to understand what you do um, to regenerate neighborhoods when um, you control 23, 24 square miles of vacant land uh, is the question, right? Um, and how do you create a neighborhood um, that responds, or housing that responds to a very different uh, paradigm? Uh, there is no scarcity of space. Um, and uh, there's also no scarcity of housing. And so one of the first things we did was put a moratorium on any new single family uh, um, housing, sing single family detached housing until every um, existing housing is rehabbed. And so every day, uh, four houses are uh, auctioned on a website. Um, they start in the thousands and they may go up to 20, 30, 40,000. Um, and these are houses that many people walked away from during the foreclosure crisis. Um, and to date, um, 3,000 uh, vacant homes have been sold uh, and rehabbed through this program. But it is uh, one house uh, at a time. Um, my challenge uh, as planning director is to find uh, a model that builds from the residential, single family residential strength of the neighborhood, um, but also accepts the, the land resource uh, as a, an advantage. Um, and uh, to do this, not just in neighborhoods adjacent to downtown, but to do this in neighborhoods that are miles away from downtown. So um, I'm gonna show uh, quickly four uh, variations on this theme. Uh, having to do with a kind of incremental approach uh, to housing. Uh, the first has to be housing, single family housing rehab. Then I'll talk about uh, commercial corridors and how densifying them. And then the idea of taking on an entire neighborhood uh, at a time and building um, an incremental strategy for uh, new construction and then adaptive reuse. So uh, the first is uh, the notion of the single family house and how do you go from one house at a time and one street at a time to one neighborhood at a time? And so this is a neighborhood, the Fitzgerald neighborhood. Um, and this is the current pattern and plan for that quarter square mile. Um, the city owns over 400 vacant lots in this quarter square mile. That's about 20 acres. Uh, and the plan uh, is to rehab um, a hundred houses that are publicly owned, were publicly owned, uh, and plant over um, 200 gardens uh, in demolishing all blight, so creating a blight-free quarter square mile, um, but having a purpose for every single vacant lot in the neighborhood. And so there is no, this is like the no-build option. There is no new construction here, um, but the assembly of the strategies together. Uh, this strategy was, was designed by Elizabeth Moss of the Australian architect um, with a series of productive uh, lots, um, about uh, 150 flowering meadows that are tied to the uh, vacant, uh, the rehabbed houses, and at the center, a park and a greenway. And so this is what the housing um, looks like. 
Uh, the average household income in this area is about $30,000 uh, a household, which means um, we're talking about uh, affordable housing, whether it be for uh, uh, purchase or rent. And the idea is that the lot next door to these rehabbed houses will have a, a, a garden installed um, that becomes a part of the ownership model. All of the lots and the houses are developed by a single developer um, who can, five, seven, ten years from now, remove uh, the garden and put a infill house if the market um, would take it. And so part of the strategy here was to, to define a typology of uses that would activate and curate every uh, open space in the neighborhood. Um, it certainly has, hasn't been attempted at this scale, and it certainly hasn't uh, been attempted in this way. This is the development team uh, that won the commission, uh, average age 35, <laughs> and it's, um, they're um, well on their way to executing uh, this plan. Um, at the center of it is uh, a park, and this is um, about 26 vacant lots. This is publicly um, it's financed through philanthropy, publicly managed. Uh, but the idea is could you, across alleys and across streets, turn a series of vacant lots aggregated in the center of the neighborhood into a coherent park? Uh, and you're seeing um, the park under construction, and you can begin to see some of the tools that are used um, to kind of bridge alley and street um, with the various uses. Um, kind of super graphics on the street to, as a traffic calming measure, full court basketball court, uh, playscapes, and ultimately creating a social space that has incredible flexibility and genuinely uh, kind of brings people together. Um, and so the housing strategy is anchoring, uh, is being anchored by a public space um, as the center of the housing strategy. Then um, the companion pieces to it is within a 20 minute walk of that park is a shopping, a neighborhood shopping uh, district, so a streetscape, um, housing, rehab, um, and mixed use, um, and uh, a greenway that connects these to those various assets. The, the second part is um, the commercial corridor and the idea of medium density mixed use being um, aggregated in uh, a walkable area um, serving single family neighborhoods. So the next thing that we did was we um, directed all multifamily housing to um, be located uh, within these um, project areas. So um, you cannot receive financing for multifamily housing if it does not um, land in one of these areas in support of that single family housing um, strategy. But these are the streets. This is what the, the streets look like. Um, very <coughs> typical um, streets that have been, um, uh, the fabric has been uh, demolished uh, and they are very auto-centric. Um, our plan is to rezone them to support a kind of walkable, pedestrian-oriented uh, development pattern. In fact, the whole concept of the frame is um, that you should be able to walk or bike within 20 minutes of your home uh, to any of the daily services that you need. Uh, and to do this, that means without a reliance on a car. And that's a new paradigm for the Motor City. Um, and so here you see an attempt to construct almost from scratch um, a in many ways, traditional neighborhood um, shopping district. Um, the three buildings you see there are all um, the first to be RFP'd, but it's also going back to a time, probably in the 50s, when um, those streets did serve a purpose as local shopping districts, and how to do that again. So this is the first um, one will be under construction um, on this Kirchville in the corner. Uh, and the mixed-use uh, development that um, will happen there. So it's about 90 units, um, um, a deep um, level of affordability, um, about 60% of the area median income, 
uh, as well as uh, market rate um, with um, retail on the ground floor. Um, but also the question of how you incrementally add density to an area that is largely single family. So we were interested, can you put a, a 12 unit development um, that has affordable housing and uh, townhouses? So the eight townhouses, there are four um, affordable units. The affordable units are above the shop uh, and they have the biggest windows and the most privileged uh, point in the development. So. We're, we're trying a number of things. One, it, what should development look like as an increment, and how can you get affordability uh, in even the smallest um, intervention in a neighborhood? Uh, then, of course, as you move on to the commercial corridors, um, the density increases very gently. Uh, so we're talking about like a maximum of six or seven stories um, that transform those autocentric corridors uh, into um, um, pedestrian-oriented corridors. And two of these projects are public, uh, public Sugar Hill and Brush House, and uh, Gratchet and Eastern Market Gateway are private. Uh, and one of, our, um, one of our goals here is to have these be exemplars of what design excellence should look like as these um, corridors are constructed in, in, with a pedestrian orientation. And part of the attraction is um, we're um, spending almost $50 million in reconfiguring um, those streets, so with wider sidewalks, with trees, with street furniture, as an incentive to the private sector to locate in this walkable four to six block stretch throughout the neighborhoods. The third would be um, housing built on the increment. Uh, these are largely um, new construction projects um, that are adjacent to downtown, and the idea of how do you build in um, for an incremental growth of neighborhoods over time using housing as the foundation block. And so Brush Park um, is a quarter square mile um, outside of the downtown, and we're talking about the missing middle density uh, in um, that can exist in uh, next to a single family house. Uh, and um, you're, you can see the pattern um, of connected small scale streets and lots that has been eroded over the course of uh, a century. And um, there are a number of these incredibly state, stately mansions still left that give some character, but this is, um, this is a 20 minute walk from downtown uh, the city owns about 60% of the land. Uh, and the question here is, can you build a dense community here, uh, which is not auto-centric, um, uh, and builds off of uh, transportation uh, innovation um, and create uh, a full-fledged neighborhood that is in itself a laboratory of housing types um, for all, uh, all incomes and all ages. Um, it has the benefit of being next to the Q line, which is a new rail line down Woodward, and you can see its adjacency. So just like with the installation of that, it has become a transit-oriented development opportunity. Uh, and there's a, a, a pretty clear acknowledgement of the TOD, the transit-oriented development. There's also a trails-oriented development, and both are drivers uh, for um, redevelopment uh, largely because people want to live next to them and exercise various modes of uh, alternative transit. And so I'm going to show two developments that respond to this uh, public infrastructure. Um, Brush Park was, a, it was about an eight, eight and a half acre, block and a half a site that was RFP'd for developers. Uh, and the winning proposal um, set the stage for this idea of incremental growth that I talked about. So um, you'll see um, part of the premise here is that contemporary buildings can sit side by side with historic buildings, that you can respect the scale of the traditional street, and that you can have a variety of housing types and incomes living on the same block. Uh, and um, this is um, what traditionally has happened, right? This is one building, uh, one developer, 
uh, double loaded corridor. Uh, and this is what our zoning, our current zoning allows. And we wanted to see if we could challenge still operating with a one, develop, one developer concept, but if we could dictate the form uh, and allow for a variety of uses and types. And so this is the outcome of a form-based code. So you can see um, this is one developer. It has five architects, it's 24 buildings, uh, and about 410 uh, units. And this is our test case to see if we can create um, a, build, uh, a neighborhood by increment. Um, and it was guided by form-based code, uh, specifically for those blocks, a block and a half. Uh, and here you can see um, the results, uh, both in terms of flats, which are taller buildings, on the north-south streets, duplex, a du a duplets, uh, carriage homes, townhomes, and historic homes all existing on the same block with no uh, parking lots. Right? Um, and so starting with the uh, three historic mansions, um, the photographer Vigara came year after year after year to document the decline of Detroit. I think he was surprised in 2015 when he came back and that same uh, ruin um, was fully restored. Um, but this is the context that we're working in, and the question is, can you restore each of those, which you're starting to see uh, them completing? Now, uh, they're not a single mansion, they are multiple units in, in these um, former mansions. And then the next question is, could you read uh, the architectural character of those historic buildings and build something denser next to them. So that's a quadruplex of four units. Uh, and then if you pull back, you can see um, how the composition of the street is being made in terms of uh, the rhythm, uh, the meter, the front yards, um, all of the kind of pedestrian scale qualities that you get in a traditional neighborhood, but done with an architecture of our time. Um, then the question is, can you um, create a different scale and a different affordability on the backsides of those same houses? And you're starting to see the muses here um, where the smaller units exist. Um, uh, it serves both as a alley, parking alley, but also as an address. Uh, and these are just, um, people are just starting to move into these. So you're talking about 800 square feet uh, on the same block as something with 2,000 square feet. And this is how we're getting the income uh, variety um, and the affordability. And then uh, uh, lining these, linking these north-south is a greenway, a pedestrian um, and bicycle greenway. So literally to walk through the neighborhood, you pass through these various um, scales of, of, of um, and incomes. Uh, and then, of course, right across the street, the first affordable um, senior housing uh, is being placed. And, and instead of having a, um, a meeting room on the ground floor, it's ground floor retail um, with seniors above across the street. So the idea is that families, young professionals, families with children, seniors are all living within um, close proximity. Uh, and you can see that it's been recently, it's just completing construction. Um, I think a particular interest of ours is the issue of scale and how you can begin, even in a courtyard building, this is the first one that has underground parking. All the rest has been surface, um, also under construction, taller buildings on the North South Street. And then uh, even the taller buildings of six stories, this is, uh, by Loha, who will be um, speaking later today. Again, how do you acknowledge and respect the scale, uh, both of the townhouses, but also the importance of the uh, primary street that will uh, be lined with retail? And this is the final version uh, as it'll be constructed. Um, so our task was, how do you take this one and a half block and now take it to the entire neighborhood? Uh, and uh, so this is where the form-based code 
comes in, it talks about the character of each street, north, south, having taller buildings, east, west, the shorter ones. This was traditionally how you would interpret the zoning codes. This is only two pages of 30 pages. Um, but this is the new zoning code. It's two pages. Uh, and we've taken what would have been a 15-step process to getting approval to now a three-step process. And this is working uh, through the Planning Commission as we speak. It has a series of nine typologies that can be placed throughout the neighborhood that give you uh, an understanding of how the lot should be laid out. The level of density is variable according to how many units you can get in. And so now we can play out a scenario of how this neighborhood might change over time. And this is one configuration. Having done this work, we then put it out for RFP to see um, what the first, uh, the second block could, uh, would yield with these guidelines. And you can start to see some of the results. Fairly dense um, block, three different types, um, greenways and, um, and permeability through the center of the block, uh, and the, um, again, 180 units on this block, and a variety of types, both in terms of urban studios um, to um, um, taller uh, flats with retail on the ground floor. Uh, another um, element that looks at some historic structures on site uh, this is the result, uh, both uh, keeping uh, the historic components and adding to that density. Um, if this is the first smaller parking garage to be done in the neighborhood, are required to have a liner building of townhouses in front of them. And you can begin to see what this area would look like. The level of affordability out of the 626 units, 181 are affordable. Um, the parking ratio is only 450 parking in this, in this assembly. And then as we build out the neighborhood, the next step, you can begin to see how this neighborhood will appear uh, over time. And so we think this is going to be one of the most mixed income neighborhoods um, in Detroit, if not the nation, when it's finished. And it will literally be a laboratory of typologies uh, for medium density um, housing. So uh, the next one I want to show is Lafayette Park. And Lafayette Park, uh, some of you may know uh, it um, as the city in the park designed by Mies van der Rohe. It's the largest collection of um, his work in the world on a single site. Uh, and what's interesting to me about the story is this is Detroit's chapter of urban renewal. Um, this was a finely grained um, urban neighborhood called Black Bottom. This is what it was when it was demolished and Lafayette Park was being erected. So it had all of the traditional components of a vibrant neighborhood in the mid 20th century. And this is what became of it. Um, I-375, um, the highway to facilitate uh, movement out to the suburbs, um, displacing over 400 um, African-American-owned businesses, 7,000 families uh, lost their home, right? And these are stories of people um, who had been forced to live in those restricted areas and then systematically removed. And so our, our question is like, how do we reconcile that history uh, as planners and urban designers. Um, so how do you go from what Black Bottom uh, was to what Lafayette Park is now? Lafayette Park is probably one of the most successful examples of a mixed income neighborhood. This is one of the experiments that worked. Um, there's rental housing, um, um, there's home ownership through co-ops, there are three, four different typologies within this neighborhood around uh, a park. And um, so the, the question is, there, there are some things to emulate about how this modernist uh, neighborhood was built, and can we, right? There, um, there is an equal equation of landscape to architecture. There are uh, courtyard houses, 
at a certain price point. There are townhouses. I will tell you, I live in one of those townhouses. <laughs> and uh, you have the presence of the uh, landscape. And so um, for us, the question was, how do you get back some of the connectivity of the historic neighborhood as it develops? And what do you do uh, with this highway, which has uh, come of age, is over 50 years, and there's a question about whether it gets rebuilt um, as is or whether it is rethought. And so our, our intention uh, was to uh, demolish the highway, um, which is this was the plan bef before I got there, um, to refurbish it, and instead to emulate um, a, an urban boulevard. Uh, many of these we know and love in the Northeast. Could you build a residential neighborhood that reconnected Laf Lafayette Park to downtown? And so we commissioned uh, Michelle Devine from Paris to look at this idea of an urban boulevard. How could you uh, cre uh, manage the traffic as well as utilize uh, the, the whole uh, for potential parking and other uses? Uh, and so um, this is a project which is uh, in the pipeline to be uh, funded in 2022. The question is, could you entice developers to build towards that future um, uh, today? And you're looking at Lafayette West. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about that notion of mixing both the linear urban boulevard with higher density housing with um, a series of connected streets back to um, downtown. And the area in the box is the first um, development to happen. And so you're seeing a mixture again of four different types, a high rise, two mid rise buildings, townhouses, uh, and carriage houses around a series of smaller public spaces, parks um, that um, face the street uh, and try to aspire to um, the modernism of the mid-rise uh, mid and high-rise uh, curtain wall building with a lower-rise um, brick uh, building. Again, three different um, architects working on a five-acre site. And this um, will be under construction in the spring um, and is uh, ready to go. The, of course, the incredible um, irony of this is that all of the developers of the areas around uh, Lafayette Park are African American. Uh, so I think there's a little bit of poetic justice happening there. Um, so the other piece uh, hap is along the trail, the Dequindra Cut. Um, so I'm going to talk about above the cut, which is the one, uh, one of two developments that are happening there. This was the Dequindra Cut about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, today, it's a three-mile bike and pedestrian um, um, corridor that's about 20 feet below the, the street level. Um, used to be a rail corridor that led to the river. And our question is, could you use that to leverage um, a mixed-income urban um, uh, intervention along the cut? And would, would you attract development um, based on a walking and biking trail? And so the project, uh, the first one is this one on the Joe Mueller site, is at the intersection of uh, Gratchet and the Dequindra Cut. And you can see um, the building being used to form public space first and foremost. Uh, so uh, about 180 units of housing um, there's a kind of interior court for parking. There are liner buildings on all sides, but its primary role is to create a public realm um, and um, create uh, a intersection between the park and a kind of urban place. And you're seeing uh, as it transitions up from the cut to the level of the um, housing and the making of a public space um, with kind of retail pavilions uh, alongside. Uh, also aspiring to the industrial archaeology of 
the Dick Winter cut, allowing housing to come right up to the edge the way some of the industrial buildings do, and those will be um, townhouses for sale. Uh, and then the last is um, housing and preservation. So uh, this theme of having a riverfront, having a city, um, one city for all of us, um, is exemplified as well by our vision for the riverfront, um, that it's for everyone. It's one of the most diverse riverfronts you will see. And as we envision this rather large park, um, could we also uh, understand and keep the historic fragments uh, that still remain on the corridor as it builds up towards a transit corridor, a higher density on uh, Jefferson. Um, so the first out the gate were a number of historic structures um, that were there and we put it out for an RFP with the provision that we wanted the things to be kept. But we also wanted to find a way to increase the density on the site so that the um, it's, it's economically viable. And so we have allowed for doubling of the density on the site and gave clear indications of kind of issues of architectural character. Uh, and this is the first building uh, to be renovated and added to. It's called the Stone Soap Building. Um, this is it in existing conditions. And this is, this is the proposal that has won, um, which is about 95 units of housing uh, retail at the ground floor and another housing type in the, on the second and third of the historic building. Um, this is it from another view. Uh, and this is the mass before. So the conditions were keep everything that is there and increase the density um, with um, an eye towards creating an inclusive um, property development. So there are 30% affordable uh, in this unit. So the idea is that even on the riverfront, we are aspiring to create that mix, mix of incomes um, for all. And that's really how we're interpreting what this means, uh, one city for all of us. Um, housing is clearly the driver, a uh, desire to direct public investment in a way to uh, incentivize private development and then uh, hold everyone accountable to creating uh, a more inclusive vision and recovery. Thank you.